Centuries before the Christian era, the Jews highly valued certain sacred writings. However, when compiling the Bible, some of these writings were overlooked. Surprisingly, fragments of the Book of Ezra have been discovered, revealing unsettling messages that are not included in the Bible. What terrifying message is contained in these books? Join us as we explore the Book of Ezra that was banned from the Bible. The Evolution of the Book of Ezra The ancient and sacred Book of Ezra, placed as the 15th gem in the respected Old Testament, plays a key role in the Hebrew Bible, which is carefully divided into three sections, the Law, Prophets, and Writings. The Law, a foundational cornerstone, comprises the initial five books of Old Testament books. The Prophets, a powerful eight-book collection, is further divided into the former prophets and the latter prophets. Lastly, the Writings, a mosaic of religious poetry and wisdom literature, contains Psalms, Proverbs, Job, and the books of Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. In the network of the Hebrew Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah find their position within the writing section. Originally bound together as a singular literary entity entitled Ezra, this volume endured until the wise decisions of Origen and Jerome in the 3rd to 4th century AD to separate the books. The formal separation into two distinct volumes only occurred in the 15th century within the Hebrew Bible. The hidden identity of the authorship of Ezra and Nehemiah is covered in the mists of time, yet tradition whispers that Ezra, the talented scribe, penned not only the book names after him, but also the chronicles of one and two chronicles. This belief stems from the notion that Ezra's administrative duties were less hectic than Nehemiah's rendering him a possible candidate. Notable features, such as detailed lists, fervent prayers, and official documents, suggest first-hand knowledge that lends belief to Ezra as the author. Ezra and Nehemiah meet to tell a historical story, recording the recovery of the Jews from the sufferings of the Babylonian exile in 538 BC, to the successful reconstruction of their temple in 515 BC. The records also detail the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls in 445 BC. These books serve as a permanent record, etching the divine interventions amid the Jews' restorative journey from 458 to 430 BC, reminding them of God's unshakable presence despite their sins. The story unfolds through two worldly times, the initial return to Jerusalem and the temple's reconstruction from 539 to 516 BC and the following ministries of Ezra and Nehemiah, dedicated to the rebuilding of Jerusalem from 458 to 430 BC. Over 120 years, these narratives unfold against the backdrop of Judah's three-time captured plight by Nebuchadnezzar, indicating Babylonian exile and a promise of redemption within 70 years. Before the ministries of Ezra and Nehemiah, glimpses into Judah's Babylonian exile reveal an appearance of normalcy, according to Jeremiah's mysterious verses. Noteworthy individuals like Daniel and his companions emerge, symbolizing Jewish blending into Babylonian governance. God's prophetic revelation foretells the end of captivity, paving the way for Cyrus's reign and the eventual command permitting the exiles to return and rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. Yet, Despite the divine invitation, some Jews, established in successful Babylonian lives, shun the difficult journey back to a desolate Jerusalem. Against this historical backdrop, Ezra unfolds, describing historical events predating his arrival in Jerusalem. The narrative rhythm mirrors a repeated pattern. Return, face challenges, and overcome challenges through a spiritual leader be it the hindrance to temple construction in Ezra 1-6 or the intermarriage problem in Ezra 7-10. The climax of Ezra 1-6 marks the revival of temple construction, encouraged by provisions and resources. In Ezra 3-4, opposition rears its head, with neighboring cities opposing the rebuilding work, employing political tricks to slow down progress. Ezra 5-6, however, unveils the sovereign plan of God 
as foretold by prophets Haggai and Zechariah, rekindling hope and propelling the completion of the temple. Ezra's touching prayers, accompanied by communal weeping and fasting, echo the collective repentance of Judah. The story climaxes with a call for the removal of foreign alliances, resulting in the establishment of a purified community in Jerusalem. However, the tale persists, seamlessly shifting into the chronicles of Nehemiah, promising a continued narrative of restoration. Books, debates, and Anglican distinctions. In the English Bible, the Protestant Bible, and the Hebrew Old Testament, there are four books associated with Ezra. These books share connections, overlap in content, and spark ongoing debates among scholars about their authorship and how they were compiled. In the English-speaking world, particularly following the Anglican numbering system, we have Ezra and Nehemiah as we know them, followed by 1st and 2nd Esdras. These latter two are simply the Latin versions of the name Ezra. Anglican tradition stands out among Protestant practices due to its inclusion of such books absent from the standard Protestant Bible. These books, sourced from the Greek Old Testament known as the Septuagint or LXX, go by various names, with two primary titles being Deuterocanon and Apocrypha. Deuterocanon, when translated, means second canon or secondary canon, emphasizing the continuity from the Hebrew scriptures to these additional books in the Greek Old Testament. This term bridges the gap from Malachi, the last prophet, to the era of John the Baptist and Jesus in the New Testament, leading into the Gospels. Deutero Canon also highlights the canonicity, arguing that these books rightfully belong in the Bible. It's more about chronology than establishing a status of rank. On the other hand, we encounter the term apocrypha, meaning hidden, uncertain, or false. Originally, this term addressed the uncertainty surrounding the origin of these books rather than their contents. Early church discussions debated whether these books should be treated like the rest of the Old Testament or kept separate. While the majority of church fathers favored their inclusion, St. Jerome was less enthusiastic, encouraging strict compliance with the Hebrew canon. St. Jerome, born between 347 and 420, hailed from a wealthy pagan family in Dalmatia. Originally sent to Rome for education, he experienced a sincere conversion to Christianity, marked by baptism under Pope Liberius. His journey into theology led him to travel to key intellectual and theological centers in the newly formed Christian empire. Ordained a priest in Antioch, he later embraced a solitary life in a nearby desert, evolving into an exceptional scholar and regarded as the most educated among the Latin church fathers. St. Jerome's lasting legacy lies in his extensive theological works, notably dedicating 30 years to creating the Latin translation of the Bible, known as the Latin Vulgate. This huge effort solidified his position as a deeply influential and orthodox theologian during the early church era. In his later years, he established a religious community near Bethlehem in the Holy Land, where he delved into writing histories and biographies and deepened his commitment to prayer and self-denial. Acknowledging his vital contributions to scholarship, St. Jerome received the honored title of Doctor of the Church. Renowned as the patron saint of libraries, archaeologists, students, and translators, his feast day is celebrated on September 30th. St. Jerome's rich and diverse life journey reflects a profound dedication to intellectual pursuits, spiritual meditation, and the enduring impact he made on Christian theology and learning. Over time, especially after the Reformation, the term Apocrypha has taken on a highly negative connotation. It evolved into an accusation, suggesting that the contents of these books are hidden, uncertain, and false, discouraging people from reading them due to perceived danger and deceit. This prevailing mistrust among most Protestants today is quite different from how the early church regarded these books. Thus, we find ourselves between two extremes, Deutero Canon, leaning towards optimism and Apocrypha, tilting towards suspicion. Striking a balance between these perspectives 
offers a renewed understanding of the place and significance of these books in the Anglican tradition. The Catholic Church and the Apocrypha The Catholic Church acknowledges seven apocryphal books, making their Old Testament comprise 46 books, unlike the 39 in standard versions. These books were officially recognized as canonical during the Council of Trent, where the Church declared, these books belong in our Bible. Since then, Catholic Bible translations like the Jerusalem Bible and the New American Bible have consistently included the Apocrypha. While some translations, such as the Revised Standard Version, offered editions both with and without the Apocrypha, interestingly, the King James Version initially included the Apocrypha, but later excluded it. Various translation committees, including those responsible for the American Standard, New American Standard, and New King James versions, chose not to include the Apocrypha at all. First and Second Esdras, although part of the Apocrypha, are not accepted by either Catholics or Protestants. Other books in this collection are Tobit, Judith, the remaining portion of Esther, the Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, attached with the Epistle of Jeremiah, the Song of the Three Children, the History of Susanna, added to Daniel, Bell and the Dragon, also added to Daniel, and the Prayer of Manasses. Speaking of the Prayer of Manasses, this book addresses a significant historical figure, Manasseh, one of the most wicked kings of Judah. While the book of 2 Kings omits a crucial detail, 2 Chronicles chapter 33 reveals that at the end of his life, Manasseh repented and prayed to God. The prayer of Manasseh attempts to capture that prayer, providing insights and bridging gaps in our historical understanding. It's worth noting that this particular book is not accepted by either Catholics or Protestants. Also, the Apocrypha contains the books of 1 and 2 Maccabees, adding depth to historical and religious narratives. Why does the Catholic Church strongly defend the Apocrypha while not recognizing the first and second Esdras? The primary reason lies not in evidence validating its authenticity, but rather in its harmony with some of their doctrines. Take, for example, the Catholic teaching of praying for the dead and the belief that sacrifices can influence the fate of the deceased. According to this doctrine, once a person passes away and enters a state of torment or suffering, prayers, and monetary offerings can change their eternal destination, shifting them from suffering to a place of reward. However, this perspective is not in harmony with the teachings of inspired scriptures. The Bible consistently asserts that a person's eternal destiny is sealed upon death. In Luke 16, there's an account involving a rich man and Lazarus, a poor but righteous individual. The rich man faces torment after death, while Lazarus finds comfort with Abraham in paradise. This scenario emphasizes a significant separation, as described in Luke 16, with a great fixed gulf between those in torment and those in comfort, making any transition impossible. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 further strengthens the biblical view that individuals face judgment after a single death and their destiny is unchangeable. Contrasting this biblical perspective, the Apocrypha, specifically in 2 Maccabees 12, attempts to justify the Catholic doctrine by suggesting a form of compensation for the deceased, aiming to release them from their sins. Bertrand Conway, seeking to defend the Catholic practice of praying for the dead, referred to this passage, asserting that Protestants consider the Book of Maccabees apocryphal but insisting it holds the same authority as Isaiah or St. John, relying on the divine, perfect witness of the Catholic Church. However, it's important to note the disagreement with this claim. Protestants do not attribute the inspiration of John and Isaiah to the authority of the Catholic Church. Additionally, the Apocrypha introduces the idea that a person can pay for sins through almsgiving, equating monetary offerings to forgiveness. This concept is covered in Tobit's statement, it is better to give alms than to lay up gold, asserting that almsgiving can deliver from death and cleanse away all sin, essentially representing the Roman Catholic doctrine of 
So much prey for so much pay. Unveiling 1st and 2nd Esdras While the Catholic Church doesn't officially recognize 1st and 2nd Esdras as sacred texts, these writings add a fascinating layer to the Old Testament narrative. Think of 1st Esdras as a backstory to Ezra and 2nd Esdras as a sort of follow-up. Despite being attributed to Ezra, there's a likelihood that he wasn't the actual author, adding a mysterious touch. 1st Esdras holds a particular fascination. Although it might appear somewhat repetitive initially, a significant portion of it, both at the beginning and the end, repeats almost word for word the conclusion of 2nd Chronicles and parts of the regular book of Ezra. While there are minor differences in numbers and certain details, it essentially echoes familiar material. Similar to how 1st and 2nd Chronicles retell events from 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st Esdras offers a slightly changed perspective, creating a historical continuity that links the end of 2nd Chronicles to the beginning of Ezra. It's like a thread connecting the fall and rise of Jerusalem, adding a positive and hopeful tone to the narrative. Yet what sets 1st Esdras apart is a unique section featuring the Rubel and three young guards. This particular story adds a distinctive flavor to the overall narrative, breaking away from repetition and introducing a fresh and engaging element to the text. Chapters 3 and 4 of 1st and 2nd Esdras, especially during the rule of the Persian king Darius, unfold a captivating tale. In this narrative, three bodyguards engage in a competition to impress the king by determining what they believe is the strongest. The victor, with the wisest statement, stands to receive rich gifts and great honors, adding an interesting dimension to the storyline. In this captivating tale, the first guard presents a strong argument, proclaiming that wine stands as the mightiest force. He cleverly argues its ability to influence the minds of all, leveling the playing field for kings, orphans, and slaves alike. Taking a distinct path, the second guard argues that supreme strength lies in men governing land and sea. He logically emphasizes the king's supremacy as the lord and master, aligning his response with political power to gain favor with the king. Yet, the tale takes an unexpected turn with the third guard, Zerubbabel, who delivers an extensive and surprising response. He praises the greatness of women, attributing their significance to giving birth to kings and rulers. This acknowledgement of the dignity and power of women proves to be remarkably unexpected in the historical context, shedding a positive light on the female sex. Zerubbabel doesn't stop there. He continues to highlight the wideness of the earth, the height of heaven, and the swift motion of the sun, crediting greatness to these natural elements. However, he concludes that truth surpasses all, emerging victorious in the contest. This subtle shift in the narrative seamlessly shifts to pointing to the Creator and God Himself, emphasizing the significance of truth and wisdom. While acknowledging possible historical inaccuracies, 1st Esdras becomes a source of study, offering a deep object lesson. It discusses the significance of Lady Wisdom and emphasizes the crucial role of truth in God's religion. Zerubbabel's discourse on truth emerges as a strong lesson for apologetics and evangelism, rendering this book a valuable and enriching read. Often overshadowed, it contains a distinctive narrative that unfolds insights into Christian living and instruction. For a gripping and meaningful exploration, consider immersing yourself in the discourse of Zerubbabel found in chapters 3 and 4 of 1st Esdras. It might just unveil invaluable lessons for your spiritual journey. Jesus' References and Prophetic Insights While 2nd Esdras might be considered a non-canonical book, similar to the Book of Enoch, it holds a unique significance. Surprisingly, Jesus referred to or quoted from this book around two dozen times in the Gospels. Even in the Book of Revelation, the angel referred to 2nd Esdras more frequently than Enoch. Despite its brief 16 chapters, this book provides profound insights. Among the noteworthy quotes, 2nd Esdras explains the concept of the narrow way, 
shedding light on why Jesus described it as such and the significance of finding it. Many Christians might not realize that this seemingly random idea connects to the end times, as explained in 2nd Esdras. 2nd Esdras also clearly mentions Daniel's fourth beast, revealing its identity and transformation from the first century to the Antichrist kingdom. Despite the uncertainties about its authorship, the importance of the 2nd Esdras is highlighted by Jesus himself, who referred to it on numerous occasions. If not directly authored by Ezra, it suggests inspiration from someone divinely inspired. Ezra's historical significance is undeniable, leading Israelites back to their homeland from Babylon in 457 BC under the reign of Artaxerxes. This event likely marked the beginning of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Every non-canonical book must be evaluated based on its agreement with the 66 books of the Bible. As we delve into 2nd Esdras, you'll witness its remarkable alignment with many canonical sections. The age of 2nd Esdras is proof of its value, with a history spanning 2,500 years. Although the original Hebrew text no longer exists, Aramaic versions from 200 AD have survived. Surprisingly, the second Esdras is present in the 1611 King James Bible, showcasing its historical and literary significance. It also finds a place in various translations, such as the Ethiopian, Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, and Georgian versions. When Jesus quotes from books like Isaiah or Deuteronomy, he often prefaces it with, it is written. Interestingly, this norm is absent when he refers to 2nd Esdras. This subtle distinction implies that 2nd Esdras might be a different genre of literature than scripture. While it contains inspired ideas, not every word may be considered inspired. This once again places 2nd Esdras in the same category as Enoch requiring discernment to distinguish between inspired and non-inspired content. When Jesus quotes from 2nd Esdras, he assumes that his audience is familiar with the book, referencing it in passing without providing all the details. This approach encourages the listeners to recall Ezra's teachings and connect them with Jesus' words, creating a gripping interplay between the two. Let us illustrate this with an example. When Jesus made a triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, riding a donkey, his followers hailed him, laying palm branches and their coats on the ground as a first-century version of a red carpet. The crowd recognized Jesus with a messianic phrase saying, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, essentially declaring him the Messiah. The Pharisees, wanting to deny Jesus' messiahship, asked him to rebuke his disciples. But instead, Jesus responded, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Luke chapter 19, verse 40. This seemingly strange phrase has puzzled scholars, who suggest that it implies all of creation speaking to what is true, whether acknowledged by humans or not. However, what many don't know is that the notion of stones crying out is a quote from the book of 2nd Esdras. In this book, an angel gives Ezra 15 end-time signs, with the sixth sign being that the stones will cry out. Jesus expected the Pharisees to recognize this quote, essentially saying that if humans failed to acknowledge him, the end times would commence, marked by the stones crying out. Interestingly, Jesus made this statement as he approached Jerusalem near the temple. This prompts the question, which stones was Jesus referring to? It appears he meant the buildings of Jerusalem, stressing the idea that 2nd Esdras was correct about the signs of stones crying out. Now, let's explore another famous phrase of Jesus about the narrow way. During the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. This statement in itself makes sense and aligns with the concept of the narrow and wide gates. Yet, what escapes the notice of many scholars is that this phrase refers to a more extensive passage in 2nd Esdras. 
Jesus presumed that his audience was familiar with 2nd Esdras, so he didn't delve into all the additional details. By uttering those words, he prompted his listeners to recall the extra details from Esdras, which, unsurprisingly, hold end-time significance. Here's what 2nd Esdras elaborates on. Imagine a vast city situated in a large valley, but the sole entrance is a narrow passage through the mountains. This passage is dangerous, with fire on one side and a sharp cliff over deep waters on the other. The path is so narrow that only one person can enter at a time. If someone is given this city as an inheritance, the only way to possess it is by navigating through this dangerous passage. 2nd Esdras, chapter 7, verse 6 to 9. Continuing the comparison, 2nd Esdras emphasizes that the entrance to this future age is narrow, filled with sorrow, trials, pain, and dangers. Only a few will pass through these tribulations and evils to receive the abundant and sure blessings of the future world. The angel, speaking to Ezra in 2nd Esdras, questions why people focus on the present instead of the future. The passage reads, then were the entrances of this world made narrow, full of sorrow and trials. They are but few and evil, full of danger and very painful. For the entrances of the elder world were wide and sure and brought immortal fruit. If then they that live labor not to enter these straight and vain things, they can never receive those that are laid up for them. Why are you stressing when you're just a regular person who can be affected by imperfections? Why let it bother you when you're only human? It becomes evident that this is the same comparison as the one in Matthew 7 that Jesus provided. However, 2nd Esdras adds a wealth of extra detail to enrich the understanding. The crucial question arises, what does this city of our inheritance represent? Certainly, the New Jerusalem described in Revelation 21-22 serves as the ultimate inheritance, awaiting us after Jesus' return. The narrow way, as emphasized by Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, is not only exclusive, but also challenging, filled with tribulations. It's a path that demands endurance and commitment. In essence, Jesus urges us not to be focused solely on our present lives, but to keep our gaze fixed on the future inheritance awaiting us. Focusing on this future reality makes the challenges of the present more bearable. Those unwilling to walk the narrow way miss the opportunity to enter the glorious city, the New Jerusalem. Second Esdras, however, doesn't conclude in the narrow way. It delves deeper, offering detailed insights into the end times and the messianic kingdom. All of this is complexly connected to the narrow way that paves the journey leading to the kingdom. Consider this excerpt. Behold the days to come, when the signs I have foretold come to pass, and the bride is revealed. What has been withdrawn from the earth will be brought back. Whoever is delivered from these predicted evils will witness wonders. The Messiah, my son, will be revealed alongside those who remain, rejoicing for a thousand years. 2nd Ezra chapter 7 verse 26 to 28. Jesus' audience during the Sermon on the Mount, familiar with 2nd Esdras, would naturally connect these words to the narrow way. When Jesus spoke of the narrow way, they likely associated it with the withdrawal and return of the bride, symbolizing a period of separation and subsequent rejoicing. This reunion with the Messiah and the thousand-year rejoicing aligns with the messianic kingdom, revealing that the narrow way indeed carries deep end-time implications, insights often overlooked by modern scholars unfamiliar with 2nd Esdras, the harmonious echo, 2nd Esdras, and Revelation. Following the vivid portrayal of the thousand-year messianic kingdom, 2nd Esdras proceeds to describe the great white throne's judgment a scene strikingly similar to Revelation's depiction. It echoes the idea that the earth will give up those resting within it, dust yielding its silent dwellers, and secret chambers delivering the souls entrusted to them. 2nd Ezra chapter 7, verse 32. In Revelation, a parallel imagery emerges, stating, 
and the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. Revelation chapter 20 verse 13. The similarity between the two accounts is clear. Continuing, 2nd Esdras unfolds a vision where the Most High takes his place on the judgment seat, indicating the passing away of misery and long suffering. A powerful message declares that on the day of judgment, the familiar celestial bodies, sun, moon, and stars, will exist no more. 2nd Ezra chapter 7, verse 33. This aligns with Revelation's depiction, which states, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and from his presence earth and sky fled away. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. The parallels emphasize the striking harmony in the descriptions. Drawing from Matthew chapter 24, verse 22, where Jesus emphasizes the necessity of shortening those days for humanity's survival, 2nd Esdras echoes a similar idea. Urging prayer for the cutting short of those challenging times, it reflects the harmony of Jesus' words with the insights found in 2nd Esdras. Chapter 2, verse 13 reads, Go, and ye shall receive. Pray for few days unto you, that they may be shortened. The kingdom is already prepared for you. Watch. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 to 12, Jesus speaks of the millennial kingdom. 2nd Esdras, chapter 1, verse 38, also mirrors the idea of people coming from the east and being led by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A pattern of shared concepts arises. Both texts convey a common narrative, strengthening their connection. Furthermore, 2nd Esdras foretells the signs appearing before the visit of the Most High upon the world. It expects earthquakes, global unrest, and disorder among nations, an agreement with the signs Jesus spoke of in Matthew. Emphasizing the repetitive nature of beginnings and ends, 2nd Esdras assures salvation for those who believe and act faithfully, allowing them to navigate the impending perils and witness divine salvation. 2nd Ezra chapter 9 verse 1 to 8. Examining the parallels, it's interesting how closely 2nd Ezra aligns with Luke's Olivet Discourse. Luke chapter 21 verse 9 to 11, 25 to 26. Luke's account warns against fear amid wars and riots, emphasizing that these events are unavoidable, but don't signify the immediate end. Nations rising against nations, celestial signs, and earthly distress are foretold with a call to remain watchful, praying for escape from coming trials. Similarly, 2nd Esdras inserts a unique refinement. The return of Jesus occurs amid these signs, neither at the outset nor the conclusion. This distinctive placement aligns with a pre-wrath rapture perspective, providing an alternative interpretation of the sequence of events. Looking deeper into biblical insights, 2nd Esdras offers an exciting perspective on Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2, specifically the image in the stone cut without human hands. Daniel records the stone striking the image's feet, breaking them, and eventually becoming a great mountain that fills the entire earth. Daniel chapter 2, verse 34 to 35. 2nd Esdras sheds light on this symbol, explaining that after the preceding signs come to pass, the Son of God will be revealed. This revelation involves a gathering of countless people engaged in battle against each other, symbolizing conflict. However, when they hear the Son's voice, they stop their dispute. The Son, identified as Jesus, stands on Mount Zion, which is not already present, but is in the process of coming. The mountain signifies the new Jerusalem, prepared in heaven and coming down as a bride. According to 2nd Esdras, the New Jerusalem is the heavenly Mount Zion, unveiled as it descends, a captivating perspective on the celestial city's role in the narrative. What are your thoughts concerning the 1st and 2nd Esdras? Let us know your opinion in the comments below.